country. Time to get caught up with the latest around the league. Let's welcome in Adam Schefter. We haven't seen Chiefs running back Isaiah Pacheco since week two due to an ankle injury. How close might we be to seeing him back on the field, Adam? There's a real possibility we're going to be seeing him Sunday, Laura. He's been working to get back. They feel good about getting him back. They've been targeting late November to get him back. And it looks like right now Isaiah Pacheco has a real strong chance of making it back this week. And if it's not this week, it certainly won't be long after. He's been limited in practice due to that ankle injury that he suffered earlier in the season against the Cincinnati Bengals. And they're hoping that this could be the weekend. I know Sam Darnold, the Vikings quarterback, has been on their injury report. It should not be an issue for this upcoming game, despite the fact that he's got the foot injury, despite the fact that he was limited in practice. The Vikings are operating like they will have him back against the Chicago Bears this weekend in a big NFC North matchup. But Darnold, again, despite being limited, looks like he's ready to go. And Mike Evans, the Buccaneers wide receiver, was a full go at practice today, which tells you that he is on track to return to the team on Sunday against the New York Giants after missing time with that hamstring injury. This is exactly when the Buccaneers thought that they would be getting him back. No Chris Godwin. He's lost for the year, but they will get back Mike Evans, and it looks like he will be playing Sunday against the New York Giants. All right, love to see him back, and certainly you wish for them that Chris Godwin could be back as well. Adam, new on NFL Live, Daniel Jones recently benched in New York. He addressed the media last hour. Take a listen. The opportunity to play for the New York Giants was truly a dream come true, and I'm extremely grateful to the Mayor and Tisch families for the chance to play here. The Giants are truly a first-class organization, and I have nothing but genuine respect and appreciation for the people who have built it and who helped carry on that tradition. There have been some great times, but of course, we all wish there had been more of those. I take full responsibility for my part in not bringing more wins. No one wanted to win, those, uh, win more games worse than me, and I gave everything I had on the field and in my preparation. Of course, this season uh, has been disappointing for all. And of course, I wish I could have done more. I'm 100% accountable for my part. Mm. Classy there. But Adam, what more can you tell us yeah. about Jones' future in New York? Well, it's over right now, Laura. They have him essentially as the fourth string quarterback. He's running scout team safety during practice. And that was his farewell to New York, despite the fact that he still is on the roster. And obviously, the Giants did not want to risk putting him out there with that $23 million injury guarantee that would be due partly due in March and partly due before training camp. <clears throat> and so right now, they are going with Tommy DeVito at quarterback. They are going with uh, Drew Locke as his backup and Tim Boyle as the third-string quarterback, relegating Jones to a role that, barring the unexpected, the unforeseen, he will not play again with the Giants. It, it is over for him, and that was his way of saying goodbye in the classy way that he did it today without the Giants and he being unable to revise his contract in a satisfactory way. It looks like he is done playing for the New York Giants. All right, we'll keep an eye and see if he lands somewhere else in the future. We're just flying around, creating chaos, getting turnovers, stuff like that, and that, that'd be a, that's a, a huge, huge uh, job for the defense to do, you know, for those guys to keep the offense off the field, creating turnovers. That's possibly holding teams to 14 points or lower, you know. Um, that's all. RC, how do you expect the Ravens to use Derrick Henry to try to get L.A. out of their preferred coverages? Man, they better run it, run it, and run it. This is a team, and Mina and I talked about this on Friday that majors in big nickel. And now in this day and age, Derwin James is as physical and as big as many of the linebackers we see week in and week out. But they play two high safeties with Molden and Gildan on the back end. And so if you can get them out of those two high safeties by running the ball, using quarterback run with Lamar Jackson as well in the zone read, now you have an opportunity to play on the outside with some of these corners and man to man like Fulton and Cam Hart and also some of the younger players that they bring in that we watch Jamar Chase and T. Higgins have success against one-on-one. -on -one. Don't run them out of these coverages. Is what they can do on the inside with some of those tackle twists that I know Marcus is going to talk about. It could be difficult in the pass game. So to me, it stick to the run even when it doesn't work because we've seen three times this season them abandoning Derrick Henry, and in hmm. those games, they've been all L's for the Baltimore Ravens. 
RC, I 100% agree, and I'm glad you led me into those inside stunts and twists because they were very effective in the first half against Joe Burrow in Cincinnati and getting after him. And they do a really good job of containing on the outside when they work in these stunts. You can see the defensive ends almost hit the brakes when they feel like they're getting too deep to allow those guys on the interior to work. It's going to be imperative for Lamar, one, to be able to get rid of the football up front, but also understand how to manipulate this pocket because you go to the second half of this game and you were able to see some plays being made. But these inside stunts and twists, when they happen, you have to manage them. And then this is where the Lamar factor comes in. You do not stop Lamar Jackson. You limit him. And if you allow this play extension that we saw from Joe Burrow when they were mounting this comeback in the second half, these are the type of explosive is plays that can hamper what they do defensively with the Chargers. Yeah. I'll be interested to see if they try that in this particular game, but if they do, it better be all four or five guys on the same page making sure you keep contain on Lamar Jackson. And Swag, I'm wondering if Todd Munkin is going to go back and self-scout himself against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Also, Lamar Jackson, only two called quarterback runs for the Baltimore Ravens, and Lamar Jackson not using his legs in scramble opportunities because when you watch the game from last week with Joe Burrow, obviously he was moving and improvising to throw the football, but he was able to create opportunities, second chance for his players down the field and for himself Absolutely. getting outside of the pocket. Will Lamar Jackson attack that team? The do it. With we're going to attack RC's connection. Guys, I was talking to some Chargers defensive <laughs> players today, and they were saying what they see on film with it the Ravens. It looks so good. I know. I don't know what happened. We're going to figure it out. What they see on film with the Ravens is the past MVP and the future MVP. A lot of respect for Lamar. All right, let's go to another great matchup this week. Elsewhere in Los Angeles, the Rams have been hot of late, winning four of their last five games. They have the Eagles this week, a team that's been winning a ton lately, too, of course. And how will this Rams offense try to gain traction against the Eagles defense? A secondary Dan said yesterday is the best in the NFL. Last season, the Eagles got off to a 9-1 start, much like this year's 8-2 start. But one major difference when comparing the two starts, and you see it right there, Philly's pass defense last season through 10 games, the Eagles had allowed 21 passing touchdowns. They were giving up nearly 250 passing yards per game this season. They've allowed less than half the amount of touchdowns with more interceptions and more than 500 fewer passing yards. Dan, how will Sean McVay try to make life difficult for this Eagles defense? Yeah, to touch on those stats, since the bye week, week six, they've only given up two touchdown passes as well. That's only wild. nine explosives, which is 20 yards or more. I think the Rams do the best job in the NFL when it comes to making passes easy for everybody on their offense, specifically a player like Puka Nakua. Glad you're with us on NFL Live today. A big NFC matchup with the 49ers is coming to Lambeau against the Packers. Adam Schefter back with us. Adam, some injuries on both sides of the ball for the Niners. Let's start with the latest on Nick Bosa. Didn't practice yesterday, Laura, and if he can't play, that means that the 49ers defensive line would look entirely different than the defensive line that lined up against Green Bay in the playoff game last season that the 49ers won. Bosch is dealing with a hip and oblique injury. It's different than the injury he already had been nursing, and his status for Sunday's game is at best right now up in the air. Now, the 49ers tight end George Kittle said yesterday that he will play Sunday, despite the fact that he's been limited in practice, despite the fact that he didn't play last week due to that hamstring injury. Kittle believes he's ready to go on Sunday against the Packers as the 49ers try to rebound after last Sunday's disappointing loss. Kittle says he will play. And Brock Purdy also has been limited in practice due to that shoulder soreness. But Kyle Shanahan said they do expect him to be out there not overly concerned despite the fact that he's been limited but you wonder how he will look on Sunday if he'll be operating at anywhere close to full strength so it's any one of a number of injury issues for a team that has already had more than its fair mm. share of injuries throughout the course of this season. Yeah, I feel like uh, Shanahan will look back on this year no matter how it ends and say that was the theme of the season. Despite having CMC back in the lineup, the 49ers posted their worst offensive output of the season this past week against Seattle. 
Their 17 points match their fewest points in a game this season. While they set season lows in yards, yards per play, and yards per attempt, McCaffrey has averaged 3.7 yards per rush through his first two games this season after averaging 5.2 a year ago. RC, why hasn't this 49ers offense been as explosive despite CMC coming back? Yeah. I mean, you're obviously missing Brandon Ayuk, but never before have we seen an offense really go from being as scary as Michael Myers to sort of looking like Chucky. <laughs> the doll. Like, I, I don't know. When, when Christian McCaffrey came back, I was expecting to see the same sort of explosion that we've seen from him before, but he seems a little stiff. He lacks a little bit of what we saw with Jordan Mason and Garendo when they were having opportunities for space, being able to create dynamic runs for the San Francisco 49ers offensively. And I thought the Seattle Seahawks did something extremely smart, especially without George Kittle using defensive backs on Christian McCaffrey in the past game. I think that they're still going to have to find a way to get him out in space, but I believe that coverage is tighter. There's more pressure on Brock Purdy, and he's having to create more, and Christian McCaffrey just doesn't seem all the way right yet. Yeah, RC, you mentioned it with Brandon Ayuk. I think we underemphasized his importance a little bit when it comes to not only the separation, but I thought I, I went back and watched last year, the rapport and understanding that he had with Brock Purdy as well is something that's missing. These guys being on the same page, you can make an argument that they were like chasing Burrow or you think about these duos, Justin Jefferson with whoever he playing with. You think about these duos that have Goff, their rapport. I'm wrong. You look against Seattle. Yeah, you look against Seattle. One, we talked about the separation not being there. But the middle of the field was clamped. Brock Purdy played with a little bit of um, unsure about where he would go with the ball. And obviously, that has something to do with the coverage. I've heard Dan time and time again talk about Brock Purdy being able to anticipate and having that clock in his head to be able to play a lot faster. He's been slowed down. And the middle of the field now is starting to be a little bit tighter. And I think Brandon Ayuk, had a tremendous amount to do with that, point. but also had a lot to do with Brock Purdy being able to play on time as well with the confidence and rapport that they had built. And Dan, let's look closely at this matchup this weekend with the Packers. Give us a couple things you think will actually be deciding factors in this game. Yeah, this is not the same Packers defense that the 49ers are accustomed to seeing. Number one, this is a very good, very stout run defense. I think specifically in the middle of their run defense. I don't think this is something that San Francisco is going to line up like they traditionally have and just get after them. The second thing is, under Jeff Hathley, they pressure you. They come after you and they blitz and they force the ball out of your quarterback's hands. Now, I do think something that they can have success with is tossing the ball to the perimeter. We saw the Chicago Bears have success running that play. The, the, the 49ers have been hit or miss running that outside toss play this season. I think that's the one run that I would feel comfortable running against Green Bay's defense if I was San Francisco. Look for that in that game. Can they get McCaffrey and those backs in the toss game on the perimeter? Because I think it's the likely run that they are able to hit. Mm. When I think about the offenses that have had success against this Packers defense, uh, something that comes to mind is, one, they attack the linebackers, and two, and this is related, heavily targeting the tight ends. This is reflected in the stats. Packers are bottom five defense in the NFL defending tight ends this year. I think back to the Arizona game. They beat Arizona by quite a bit, but Trey McBride uh, went for nearly 100 yards in that game, and they got him on Quay Walker over and over and over, and that's why I think the return of George Kittle is massive for San Francisco. The other thing is, Dan, you talked about how the Packers blitz. Kittle, to me, is Purdy's best answer versus the blitz. It's been the case now for a couple of no years. Doubt. So to have him back in the lineup, I thought his absence last week against Seattle was massive. And so him being back, I think, is a really, really huge, uh, a huge coup for San Francisco. All right, so um, let's get you the latest on Brock Purdy from Nick Wagoner, our 49ers reporter, he said quarterback Brock Purdy, he's got the right shoulder soreness. He was on the field for the first couple of periods, open to the media, but then went into the weight room. So unclear if or how much more he'll do today mm. in practice. Keep an eye on that for sure. Back to tonight's game. We showed it to you earlier, a wintry mix there in Cleveland, the dog pound. Steelers, Browns, a great rivalry coming your way in just a few hours. And Adam Schefter back with us now. Some big names on the injury report this week. Let's start with the availability of Alex Highsmith. 
The Steelers have ruled them out for tonight, Laura. That's a blow to the Steelers' pass rush in their defense, playing without Alex Highsmith, but it was too much to ask in a short week for him to be out there. And so it will be up to T.J. Watt and crew to be out there with Highsmith sideline with that ankle injury that he suffered earlier. You saw him limp off the field against the Commanders, has not played since then, and still needs more time to get ready from that particular injury. As for the Browns and their standout cornerback, Denzel Ward, despite the fact that he was listed as day-to-day -day with a chest injury, he is off the injury report and expected to play tonight despite the rib injury, the ankle injury. He's had all sorts of issues this year that he's played through, and he's played at a high level. He will be out there tonight for Cleveland. That's a boost for the Browns defense tonight. And while questions and speculation continue to swirl about the future of Kevin Stefanski, the Browns are not expected to make any type of move here now or anytime soon. Stefanski signed a contract extension this past summer. He's a two-time coach of the year. And it still hasn't stopped people from speculating on the fact that he could be facing an issue with his job. But from what I've been told, that is not the case at all. Stefanski is locked in there, unless the Browns decide to be the Browns and make a change. But that is not expected to be the case with the two-time Coach of the Year winner who did sign the extension this summer.